So we're here at the ID Tech X show and uh, who are you? I am Professor Greg White uh, and I'm actually a physical activity exercise specialist. Um, uh, are course, you a nutritionist? Well, I, do you know, I, I, I cover the whole gamut really. Yeah. So I'm the director of the Centre for Health and Human Performance in London where we look after all areas of human health and performance from nutrition to biomechanics to physiology to, to medical. Um, so it's quite a broad, a broad spectrum where we try to enhance people's quality of life as well as their length of life. But is it a company or is it for the government or? No, nope. so this is a, it's a, a private company. Um, and really what we're trying to do is actually sort of circumvent traditional healthcare to some extent and actually deliver what is required because it's, it is a very complex picture because it deals with people uh, and people are the most complex things to change, uh, particularly when it comes to behavior. So we do an awful lot around behavioral change. So what is a, a, a bigger factor? Is it the food or is it the physical activity? Well, it, it, you know, it's a classic question. Is it, is it consumption or is it expenditure? In other words, is it what we eat or is it the activity that we have? And, and the, the very simple answer to that is it's both. Uh, is that what we put in our mouths is very important, both in terms of the quantity, but also the nature of it, the quality of it. Um, and so focusing on things like sugar content, for example, simple sugar content, uh, is really important when it comes to certain, uh, certain diseases or disease states, things like metabolic syndrome, like type 2 diabetes, for example. But equally, it's also about volume. It's about portion size, it's about number of calories. But balanced against that, of course, is, is what we expend, how active we are. Uh, and I think the, the crucial thing about activity is that not only does it help in terms of weight management, but actually activity is central to all-cause mortality, so heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, but it's also about improving mental and emotional health, and also physical activity can actually improve social health in terms of social interaction. So for me, physical activity is the most important, but nonetheless it's part of a, of a whole host of different things that are required. So how does it help for cancer, for example? Well, I mean, physical activity in cancer, the work that I do is actually around optimizing patients who are undergoing therapy. Um, I mean, what we know is that people who are more active uh, have a lower prevalence of cancer, all told. So in, in terms of actually prevention, physical activity is a very good preventative strategy. But if you have cancer, then you'll have to have treatment. And that treatment is chemotherapy, it's radiotherapy, and, and often it can be surgery. All of those are massive physical insults uh, on the body. And, and the, 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 the physical capacity of the body to withstand that insult is really very important. What we do is we do a, a process called prehabilitation. So what we do is we optimize the patient prior to treatment. We also optimize them during treatment to try and ameliorate some of the negative effects of treatment like chemotherapy. And then of course rehabilitation following treatment. So following chemotherapy, following surgery to bring them back to a, a, a normal or better quality of life than they had. Because a cancer patient has to go through chemotherapy and there's also the radiation therapy, right? Well, and those both, they kind of destroy all cells, kind of? So you need to do more physical activity than otherwise to kind of stay strong? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, the thing is that there's a whole host of different interventions, different treatments you have as cancer. But, but something like chemotherapy, for example, is, is cytotoxic. It actually destroys cells. Uh, and it's also, it, it's also, the newer drugs are now much more selective. But in general, it's relatively non-selective, so it destroys everything. Uh, and, and what you do see is there's a whole host of, of downstream cascades of chemotherapy, things like uh, sarcopenia, you get reduction in muscle mass, um, which is very important because what that underpins is your functional capacity. So your ability to stand up from the chair, your ability to walk. So some of the things that we do with physical activity is try and dampen, reduce the effect, that cytotoxic effect of chemotherapy on the body. Uh, one great example of that is actually in terms of heart failure. Uh, what we know is that, that some chemotherapies are cardiotoxic. They have a cardiotoxicity which, which impacts on the heart. Intervene with exercise whilst you're having chemotherapy and you can reduce that toxicity. So there's lots of ways where, where simple interventions with physical activity can have a very positive effect, both acutely and chronically. So, um and then, for example, a lot of people have arthritis. Do you have yep. any uh, recommendations for uh, what do they need to do? Is this similar kind of stuff? Just well, different? Or? Obviously, two different types of arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory uh, autoimmune issue. 
Uh, and you've got osteoarthritis, incredibly prevalent in the population, particularly as we age. Uh, there is only one effective treatment for osteoarthritis, and that is exercise. Uh, in very simple terms, what, what, what you get is you get movement of joints, and that movement of joints is what causes pain. If you can stabilize the joint, and we do that by improving strength, and also improving strength endurance, what you do is you stabilize the joint, you reduce movement, you reduce pain. And so it's incredibly valuable exercise, and, and paradoxically so, because you think if I'm in pain, I don't want to move, but actually the more you move, the more exercise you do, very focused, very specific, you can improve osteoarthritis. But so you are able to, uh, uh, because it hurts a lot on the joints, you yep. can still... Uh, Sorry, yep. just one second. Do come along and listen to these informative talks from global organizations. That's the exhibition theater is now open. Do go along and for the talks from global organizations. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so. Um, the joints are hurting, but how yep. do you train the muscles if they have a difficulty moving? Well, do you know, it's a very interesting one because obviously you're in pain. So the use of selective analgesics, so using painkillers at the right time, can actually enhance the physical activity. So, so actually taking them before you're physically active is important to control the pain to enable you to be more active. The more active you are, the stronger, more stable the joints become, the less the requirement for analgesics in the long term. So, so what you are doing is you're taking a slightly different approach across time in response to what your requirements are. And I think often what we do with healthcare is we take, it's a, it's a one size fits all approach, is that, is that this is what we do, this is the algorithm, and so we're just gonna go ahead and do it. What we do need to do is actually personalize that. And that's a lot of the work that we do is actually about personalizing, customizing it, so it's bespoke to the individual, so we optimize their health. So uh, do you have like a private clinic or how does it work? Yep. So and people sign up and then uh, you help each of them separately? Yep, so, so, so I run a, a private clinic on Harley Street in London called the Centre for Health and Human Performance. Uh, and what we do is we, we effectively look after individuals. Uh, and so we, what, what we do, which is perhaps slightly different from what a, what a global health service does, is we really do individualize our care so that we optimize what we're doing with our clients so that we effectively move to a, a faster solution uh, for, the, for the particular issues that they have. Not an easy process, not a quick process, uh, and not necessarily a cheap process, but it does deliver results. So how's uh, cancer is a big issue in society. How's it being, how's the progress in fighting it? And uh, uh, is all the solution you think in your field or a uh, solution is no. <laughs> some kind of a magical drug and a mix of what you do? And no, I think, you know, I mean, cancer is ubiquitous now. We all are touched by cancer, whether, whether we suffer from cancer personally or we know somebody who has or does suffer from cancer. Um, I, I, and I think what the solution is, is it, it's multi-agency. Uh, it is the development of new drugs. Uh, so it is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, equally, for me actually, it's much more of a focus on prevention, is that what we want to try and do is prevent cancer in the first place, uh, for which lifestyle is very important in that. So smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity and diet, all of those things which are modifiable, those modifiable risk factors, really very important. So the agencies that are involved in that become a crucial part of prevention. Uh, but when it comes to treatment, what we're trying to do is optimize that treatment. So the development of new drugs makes a difference, but also when we're using those drugs. May I have your attention, please? Ah, sorry, one sorry, second. Sorry. There may be a slight delay to the conference tracks. Again, there might be a slight delay to the conference tracks. Uh, just stay tuned and I will uh, make the announcement uh, a few minutes before they're begin okay. about to begin. And, so we get one more announcement. There. Sorry, sorry. Again, there's going to be a slight delay to the conference tracks. I can just finish that bit anyway. So, 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 so I mean, in terms of treatment, it, it is multi-agency. It's about the development of new drugs. Uh, that's clearly important. More targeted therapy, uh, which addresses the specific cancers. Um, add on top of that, though, it's actually about, uh, it's about coping with, with that treatment. Uh, so, in other words, optimizing the quality of life during treatment, which is a lot of the work that we do through physical activity, through nutrition, through lifestyle interventions. And then, of course, it's about the rehabilitation of the patient as well. So not just prehabilitation, but rehabilitation as well to bring the patient back to a high quality of life, not only length of life, but the quality of those lives. So uh, there's a lot of women that get breast cancer. Yep. And usually it's a little uh, thing in the beginning, right? 
and then how do they optimize their chance not to get uh, what's called a reoccurrence of cancer? Yep. Is it stuff you talk about? No, it's exactly that. And I, th I think that that's it's a very interesting point that you raise. I mean, we, we know an awful lot about breast cancer. Uh, what is what is less well known is the fact that more men die of prostate cancer than women die of breast cancer. So, so there are there, there are cancers which have a very high prevalence uh, in, in certain populations, men and women. Uh, and, and I think that what one of the key things to that is number one is prevention. We've just spoken about that. The other thing is about early identification. What we've done with breast cancer is we've become much more aware of the signs of breast cancer. So physical examination is, has underpinned the early identification. Add on top of that the development of technology around mammograms has assisted in that process. And also then the development of bespoke drugs, a bespoke pharma, which is targeted therapy, things like Herceptin, for example, for HER2 positive breast cancer, have made a massive difference as well. Uh, but of course, that is just one cancer. There are lots of different cancers. Uh, and, and it requires that targeted approach on all of those other cancers to make the same sort of uh, strides that we've made in breast cancer possible. So a lot of physical activity is, is, a, is a very important. Listen, physical activity is central to health without any shadow of doubt across the lifespan. So whether it's from pregnant mothers impacting upon their unborn child through childhood into adolescence, into adulthood, and particularly into old age, physical activity is central to quality of life as well as length of life. Have you uh, come into contact with many people that uh, didn't do any physical activity and then they get breast cancer and then suddenly they become huge athletic people? I, I, I mean, it's a really interesting one. I mean, we've done an awful lot of work, for example, around breast cancer, um, where we look at, 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 at women who get breast cancer uh, and then look at intervening with physical activity and, in fact, changing lifestyles post-diagnosis. And I think that's a very important thing to remember is that the, the bottom line is it's not the end of the road. What it is, it's, it's the beginning of the next chapter. And what we can do is any change, any positive change in lifestyle will have a positive effect on health no matter when we do that. So what we should never do is think it's too late to make a change. Now is the right time to make that change and we will benefit from that change as we go forward. Uh, and another big issue in society is uh, the heart issues people have, right? Yep. Uh, so how much do you do with that? Well, look, I mean, cardiovascular disease is, has always been high on the agenda, if not number one on that uh, early mortality agenda. Uh, coronary artery disease uh, is a, a particular issue. Um, but there are lots of lots of cardiovascular diseases which both limit quality of life and also limit length of life. Again, some of those, like coronary artery disease, for example, are heavily influenced by lifestyle. So diet, physical activity, smoking, alcohol, all of those things which are modifiable, which we can change, can all affect cardiovascular disease. But we do have control to reduce their impact by changing our behaviors. So, so for me, one of the things that I spend my life talking about really is actually about prevention, is that if we can modify our lifestyles, if we can improve our lifestyles, we can reduce the risk of developing a whole host of non-communicable disease. And uh, you had, for example, the example of the person who got a new heart and then cycled 360. So uh, if you get a heart, uh, uh, what's called a operation. Yeah, heart transplant. It's very yeah. important, or heart transplant, yeah. or even uh, what's called bypass and yeah, all that bypass, stuff. Yeah. Then people after that, they have to do change the lifestyle or physical yeah. activity. It's so important. Uh, Absolutely right. Otherwise it could get bad again, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. I, th I think, I mean, it's a, it's a very important point you make. And that is that, that, that the intervention of medicine does not confer future benefit is that we are still responsible for our own health uh, and, and whether we've had bypass surgery whether we've had a stent fitted in, in, in a narrowing coronary artery uh, whether we've had a heart transplant the bottom line is that we still need to look after our anatomy and physiology our health resides in our hands and positive behavioral change will make a positive difference to our health now and into the future. And then uh, the huge issue now is uh, more and more diabetes. Yep. And uh, how bad is that? And what's like, uh, and, and then that's exactly what you're saying again? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there are lots of what we call non-communicable diseases. So diseases you don't catch, which are lifestyle related. And because of that, they're lifestyle modifiable. And type two diabetes is a very good example of that. And of course, what we know is, is that physical inactivity, poor diet, obesity are all directly linked to the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. 
does that matter? Well, it does because type 2 diabetes is, uh, is profoundly bad for your health globally, uh, acutely and chronically, but also for the economy. I mean, it costs a huge amount to, uh, to look after type 2 diabetes. So the drain on, on a healthcare system for what is a lifestyle modifiable, not necessarily curable, but modifiable disease is enormous. So again, it's about personal responsibility, but it's also our job to work on a global responsibility in society to try and enhance that environment. And that comes down to, to legislation around transport, around uh, food, etc. that we all have a role to play in improving the health of the nation. So it's government stuff? No, it's government and it's personal. You know, I think I, I, to some extent it's very easy us. It's very easy for us as humans to blame somebody else. And so what we can do is we say, well, the government should sort that. Well, actually, when the government sorts it, we then call them Big Brother. And so there's a no-win situation. But but I, I think what, again, what this is, the health of the nation is is multi-agency, and it requires everybody from government, the heads of government all the way through, and most importantly, I would say, to us as individuals to care for our own health. And if those multi-agencies can come together to deliver a package which improves health, that's where we're trying to get to. So for example, you say diabetes is a huge cost, so what is the actual cost? What happens? In, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, the, they need to go to the hospital a lot? Or? Yeah, so I mean, the, the cost of, of diabetes, for example, currently in the UK, we, we run around four to five million type two diabetics. That costs the NHS about a quarter of the total healthcare budget, somewhere in the region of about 25 billion pounds a year, uh, which, which is spent on the treatment of type 2 diabetics, whether it comes in a drug form with things like metformin, uh, all the way through to actually hospital admissions, and then the downstream events or uh, causes of things like peripheral vascular disease leading to amputations. All of those things cost money and have an, a massive economic burden, which of course, in, in a healthcare system that we have in the UK, if you take money away from the healthcare budget for one particular disease, it reduces the budget availability for other diseases. So actually, we have a responsibility to care for the whole system. So of course, all the prevention has to be done. Is there any chance that once people have diabetes, they can be fixed from it? Or is something that yeah. just stays with you? No, 100%. Is Uh, uh, diabetes is curable. It's curable, uh, and, all and, types? And we've, um, I mean, type 2 diabetes, remember, is yeah. a, the big distinction between type 1 and type 2. But type 2 diabetes, we can improve. Uh, and, and we can improve and potentially cure. Uh, and we've actually done it on a TV show where we showed the reversal of, of type 2 diabetes through diet and physical activity. Well, so lifestyle modification, it does take work. So then that person becomes like normal? They become, they become normal. So, so they're... they're, they're their markers of diabetes return, reverse to normal. Uh, so it is possible. How many people have done that? It's very, very few? No, I mean, it, 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 to some extent, there's a, grow, there's a growing understanding of type 2 diabetics that they can actually reverse the condition. And, and, and in reversing, you can't, it's not about necessarily curing, but what you can do is you can reduce medication doses by making lifestyle changes. All of that improves quality of life. So it is lifestyle modifiable. And I think what we need to do is actually help people to make those changes to their lifestyle in order that what we can do is help them control type 2 diabetes in the general population. So what if you uh, became the minister of uh, health and stuff like that? Uh, uh, would you, um, is there some way that all these amazing, let's say Sainsbury's and Tesco's and all that stuff can be a little bit encouraged to I don't know, uh, put stuff a little bit more easy for people to understand that exactly what's healthy, what's not, or maybe customizable for yep. every person. When you go to the store, what's good for you? Yep. And then also the recipes and all that stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, or is it just right. up to people to figure it out? I think, you know, I think, I think what's interesting for me is and why this conference is so important. Actually, technology has a role to play in, in, in that customizing uh, of, of the requirements for an individual. In, in other words, creating a bespoke individualized, we, you know, we talk about personalized medicine, but actually what we need is personalized lifestyles. And I think tech has, has the opportunity to do that. Um, it, it can be incredibly confusing uh, because of, of information overload. And I think what, what tech, the requirement of tech is to simplify that 
and also tailor it and personalize it. And, and that really, for me, is where the future is. Because it's, if we can make it easy for people to understand, easy for people to adopt, then you're much more likely to be successful. So everybody needs uh, uh, the, the most advanced fitness tracker that has blood pressure sensitivity, that has uh, 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 all these other kind of stuff built in. Maybe uh, it should be like a national priority to make sure everybody gets one. Yeah, uh, I mean, the answer to that is no. Uh, it, no? <laughs> it's not about complexity. I, I, think, I think to some extent what, what, what the industry, what the tech industry has to understand is about simplicity. Is that what we're talking about is behavioral change. It's the most difficult thing to do is to change human behavior. And I think the key driver for that, particularly when it comes to health, is simplicity. It, 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 you know, is that <coughs> Einstein coined it beautifully, and, and that is that, that genius is the ability to explain the complex in simple terms. And that's what we've got to do with, with healthcare. That's what we've got to do with, with quality of life, with behavioral change. We have to make it simple. Add on top of that, we have to make it accessible. So it's not about the most expensive wearable tech because the bottom line is actually that, that becomes exclusive rather than inclusive. What we've got to do is we've got to find solutions which are simple and affordable and then personalize them so that they can actually promote and produce behavior change. Uh, do you partner with uh, like uh, rehab uh, resorts, some kind of places where there's good weather and there's people helping people with like good food and uh, uh, a physical everyday stuff or should people just be able to do that from London or from, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's an interesting one is that what, what there is is this, this inverse relationship between affluence and health uh, is that actually the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be unhealthy per se. So there are high, higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease, of type 2 diabetes, uh, but you're more likely to be inactive, more likely to smoke, more, more likely to drink uh, excessively. And, and, and so the solution, to the, the solution to the healthcare problem that we have in society is not about providing expensive, complex solutions. So, so uh, going away to the Maldives on a retreat is very lovely if you can afford it. Uh, and the bottom line is that the vast majority of the population can't afford that. So it, it does provide a, a solution to some, what we have to look at is we have to look at, at not only a multi-agency approach, but actually a broad-based approach, which delivers solutions for everybody in society. Um, and uh, so do you have uh, constant communications with all the, the ministers and stuff like that? Um, do they consult you and, uh, or, yep. or you just work in your company? <laughs> no, no. So, yep. so I, I work very hard. I, I'm, the, the, I'm the chair of the research advisory group for, for, a, for a group called UK Active who effectively are the lobby group to government on physical activity. Uh, and so we work very closely with government um, to, try and, to try and educate, to some extent, uh, those in government as to the issues that, that surround healthcare in our society, but also to provide solutions. In other words, connect them. So connect them to, you know, the, the, the guys like are here today at ID uh, Techs is that it's, it's the innovators in our field which are the future of our field. Uh, and so connecting industrial partners into government to provide solutions for what are very complex issues is part of the way forward to solve the healthcare issues in society. So are you optimistic about what's going on? Or are there some countries that are amazingly doing something really cool that everybody should copy or? Uh... I, I tell, I, I, am I optimistic? It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to think I'm always optimistic, but I think in saying that, what you can never underestimate is, is the size of the problem that we have. This is a massive change that is required. And I think where you see countries that do it well, invariably it's embedded in their culture. And I think what we are trying to do is actually trying to change that cultural reference, of, particularly of Western society, places like the United States and, and, and Great Britain. Uh, if you can change the, the, the cultural approach, if you can change people's attitudes, then you have a much better chance of changing behaviours. And those changing behaviours will lead to positive health outcomes. So it is, I'm optimistic, but it's a very big job and a very complex job. Actually, the life expectancy is kind of uh, not really increasing as it used to. What, and it's kind of going down even well, because of uh, this issue? So, so what, we, what we have now is we have the first, we, the children, of today are predicted to live shorter lives than their parents. That's the first time in human Whoa. history 
And, and I think what that does is that articulates the, the, the level of problem that we face. Uh, and that, that sh simply shouldn't happen, not with the advances that we have in healthcare, in pharmaceuticals, in diagnostics, in tech. That should never occur. But it comes down to one thing, and that is about behavior. Uh, and so therefore, we have to work incredibly hard if we are to improve the lot of our children and our grandchildren as we move forward. Is Japan a good example because they live longer, or who's, a good, who's, well, a, who's know, great I mean, at this? You know, there, there, are lot, there, there are lots of good examples worldwide of longevity. Uh, so if we look to, to the Middle East, look at places like Japan. Equally, if, if we move to Europe and we look at places like Greece, we t often talk ad infinitum about the Mediterranean diet. Um, but but there, there, are, there are good examples of longevity. But equally, it's not just about length of life, it's actually about quality of those years. It's about life in those years, not years of life. And I think really what we have to focus on is not just about increasing length of life. What we have to focus on is improving the quality of lives. Uh, do, you, uh, do you also work with the, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, 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 the girls that are super thin, I forgot, the, the uh, anorexics, anorexics yeah. and bul bulimics yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Yep. Is that also a, yeah, no, a absolutely. Uh, topic? I, 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 I think the interesting thing is that you have to be very careful with messaging and, and the media has to be very careful about messaging. What, what we have driven through the media is an aesthetically obsessed population where obesity is such a big issue because we talk about size, it's about aesthetics. Of course, what that has done to some extent is it's driven, uh, it's driven a rise in anorexia and bulimia uh, because those people who are susceptible to those messages are actually being affected by them. Add on top of that, if, if we think about things like pregnancy, uh, the messaging around pregnancy to not, not gain excessive weight has actually led to a lot of underweight pregnant women. So, so some of the message can be counterproductive. So I think what we have to be very careful about, this is not about hammering or, uh, or it, it, this is not about vilifying certain groups in the population. I think we have to be much cleverer, much smarter about the messages that we're sending out to make sure again that they are bespoke, personalized messages to help people improve their own quality of life.